the pure blood pretense by murky blue matter. Summary. Harriet Potter dreams of going to Hogwarts, but in an alternate universe where the school only accepts purebloods, the only way to reach her goal is to switch places with her pureblood cousin. The only problem? Her cousin is a boy. Has one of my father's pranks turned your brains to porridge? Arcturus Rigel Black clamped a hand over his cousin's mouth while glancing about the musty hallway anxiously. You can't just say things like that in the open, Harry. Don't you know what your mum would do to us if she heard? Harriet Potter allowed herself to be pulled down the hall, up the narrow staircase and into Archie's bedroom, quite used to her cousin's dramatics. Her mother was safely out of earshot in the parlour with her fathers and uncles, and it wasn't as if the decapitated heads of house elves past were going to rat them out. But when Archie wanted drama, drama was created. She waited patiently while Archie dragged the chest of drawers over to barricade the door and settled for a very small eye-roll when he stuffed his handkerchief in the keyhole for good measure. Now! OK, now! He plopped down on the bed as though the last five minutes had exhausted him beyond endurance and stared at her through his untidy fringe. Please, 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 tell me you weren't joking. She took in his pathetically hopeful expression with a small smile. I wasn't. I convinced Mum and Dad that I want to attend the American Institute of Magic. Not that it had been a hard sell, that she was showing any amount of enthusiasm for a school other than Hogwarts was a great relief to her parents, no doubt. I can't believe it! Archie flopped back onto the covers and blinked at the ceiling like an owl dazed by the sun. It's happening. I'm really going to be a healer. Uh, Harry, I... He took a deep, steadying breath. I don't know how I'll ever thank you. Harry reached out to pat her cousin gently on the hand. You're helping me just as much, remember. Without you taking my place at AIM, I couldn't take yours at Hogwarts. Right, guess not. Archie laughed a bit breathlessly and a grin lit up his round face with mischief. So, what's next? Harry pulled a well-worn piece of parchment from her pocket. She took quill and ink from Archie's nightstand and crossed offly through teeth to parents from their list. Archie had written the list which explained why Jump with Joy was the only item apart from Become a Girl that wasn't crossed off. Well, she said, we can't switch trunks until the night before we leave, so other than getting hold of the polyjuice potion, that's it. Right, Archie said. So when I get to AIM, I'll tell the headmistress that whoever transcribed the forms over flu messed up and my name's Harry, not Harriet. They won't know the English Book of Gold well enough in America to think anything of it. Right. What I don't get is how you... Here Archie pointed sceptically in the general direction of her face. Are going to be me? Because you're so unique, Harry said dryly. Everyone knows of the black air, but you don't really have any friends. Oi! Besides me, and I inherited enough pure-blooded features from my dad to pass even Lord Malfoy's scrutiny, she finished, tilting her nose up to emphasise the aforementioned good breeding. Archie narrowed his eyes in mock judgment. Hmm, yes, this one does have the pure blood nose and cheekbones. The eyes are a bit vulgar, if only they were a stately grey rather than that common green hue. But the perfectly pointed chin more than makes up for it. But the hair! Oh, dear Merlin, never did a pure blood see the like. Harry tossed a pillow lazily at his snobby expression. Our hair is the same colour, black as your family name. It's not the colour that's the problem, he chuckled. It's the texture. The potter mop is quite distinctive. It's not that bad, Harry said, scowling defensively, as her cousin gave her an expression of patent disbelief. Archie shook his head ruefully. Sorry, Coz, but anyone in England who sees that hair will right away associate it with your father. His picture's in the paper too often. The hair has to go if you want to pass as me. "'But you have long hair?' she frowned, fingering a shoulder-length lock. "'It'll seem odd if you suddenly wear it short. "'We'll make it a grand gesture. "'Tomorrow you and I are both cutting our hair in honour of the end of our childhood. "'With luck it'll make you look like a girlish boy and me like a boyish girl,' Archie said. "'She noted he didn't sound enthusiastic at the prospect. "'Harry grimaced herself, just imagining the look on her mother's face when they came back from the salon. "'There was nothing for it, though.' They had to look as alike as possible if this plan of theirs was going to last beyond the first term. Once their ruse got under way, a few inches of hair was going to seem like nothing compared to some of the other things they'd have to do. 
The next day, she and Archie went to one of the Diagon barber shops and said goodbye to their long, and in Harry's case, unruly hair. Before she knew it, the wayward crow's nest her father always tousled when she came near was gone. In its place were close-cropped locks that curled gently around her forehead and ears. I looked too delicate with my face all exposed. Harry frowned while squinting at herself in the mirror. They'll know I'm a girl. They won't, Archie assured her, admiring his own shorter style. She had to admit that, put next to one another, there was a remarkable similarity between the two of them, not enough for their parents to mistake them, but enough to put doubt into a stranger, perhaps. Pure-blooded children generally have delicate features anyway. You only think you look exposed because you're used to that lion's mane overwhelming your features. He reached over from the chair next to her and plucked the glasses from her face. There, don't we look like twins? I can't see anything without my glasses, she said, rolling blurry eyes. Archie grinned. That's going to be a problem. We need to get you contacts. I'm thinking steel-coloured or maybe argent. He peered at himself in the mirror thoughtfully. What do you think? Do I look like an argent to you? You look like an idiot to me. "'Harry informed him. "'Well, you better practice your village idiot expressions, then.' "'Archie laughed. "'Seeing as you have to be me in a few days, "'maybe I'll improve you,' Harry said, smiling. "'By the time you're yourself again, "'I'll have set the bar so high people will say, "'What happened to that Archie Black? "'He was so collected in school, "'and now he seems rather buffoonish. "'Careful, cousin, "'or I might do something novel to your reputation, too,' "'Archie threatened with an answering grin. "'Do your worst.' Harry shrugged. I'll just assume your identity permanently. Archie grimaced. Can we make every effort to not have that happen? No offence to womankind, but I really don't want to be a girl forever. You're not actually going to be a girl, she reminded him. I'm the one who has to lie about my gender for seven years. They both lapsed into a thoughtful silence, the full scope of their intentions beginning to creep past their mental defences. It'll be worth it, Archie said at last just before the hairdresser returned with the bill. It will, she agreed. It would have to be. Their last night at home arrived quickly, and Archie packed everything he could possibly need for a school he wouldn't ever be attending. He had mixed feelings about their ruse, despite his readiness to go forward with it. The prospect of lying to his dad for the next seven years was an unhappy one. Now that Mum was gone, he was all his dad had left and if their deception was discovered, it would likely cause a rift in their relationship, but on the other hand, it's not as if they were hurting anyone. Harry got to chase her dream of studying under Master Snape, and Aeem had the best healer certification track of any Western magical school. By the time he graduated, he'd be a fully qualified mediwizard, several years ahead of an equivalent student of Hogwarts standards. Well, he would be, if the two of them pulled it off. When he'd finished packing what was essentially Harry's trunk, he and his dad went over to Potter Place in Godric's Hollow for dinner. Uncle Remus was already there, setting the table. Remus wasn't really his uncle, nor was James come to that, but they all considered one another family, so exact blood relations didn't really matter. "'Are you psyched for school, Archie?' James asked once they'd all sat at the table. Lily nudged him reprovingly with her elbow, glancing at Harry with unveiled concern, but James grinned reassuringly at his wife and continued talking over the spread. "'You're going to love Hogwarts. No place like it anywhere. Why, the things me and your uncle and father got up to when we were there. As the representative of the second generation of marauders, you'll have to carry on the family legacy of pranking the daylights out of unsuspecting defence against the dark arts professors,' Sirius cut in. He barked out a laugh and slapped Remus on the back. Remus shook his head exasperatedly, but didn't say anything to rebuke him. Archie knew it was Remus's opinion that Sirius laughed much too rarely. Archie's mother had passed away a few years ago of a rare, wasting sickness, and his dad really hadn't been the same since. Neither had he come to that. "'Why just the defence, professors?' Archie asked, playing along. "'Is that part of the tradition?' "'Eh, not really. It's just that... They are usually the best targets. James twirled his fork thoughtfully. The job's been cursed as long as anyone can remember, so you never get the same one two years in a row. And rookie professors are the easiest marks, Sirius winked at his son. Though if you want to prank Snivellus once or twice, your old man would be much obliged. Don't call him that, Lily said automatically. It wasn't infrequent she had to make the request. He's a good man. 
not to mention a genius, Harry added quietly into her fish. No one acknowledged this remark, as it too was commonplace. Harry had been in a state of near idol worship ever since she read an article in Potions Quarterly about his work with the Wolfsbane Potion. His cousin came off as taciturn and uninteresting, if not downright cold to most people, but she had harboured a deep fascination for potions. She'd spent the better part of her free time stirring up unlikely concoctions in her parents' basement for as long as he could remember. Archie knew his cousin wanted nothing in the world but to brew potions for the rest of her life, preferably alone. But in her mind, mediocrity in the art was not enough. The only way to become the greatest potions mistress in the country was to study under the greatest potions master in the country, and he, if you believed Harry's judgment on the subject, was at Hogwarts. Archie could relate to her single-mindedness. He felt much the same about healing, but he wished she'd pick her battles when it came to Uncle James. Eleven years later and you're still defending the man!' James made a face. Eleven years later and you're still holding on to a childish rivalry!' Lily returned, looking to Remus for support. "'Remus thinks it's ridiculous, don't you?' "'She has a point,' the werewolf said mildly. He glanced between James and Sirius with a slight smile. "'There's no need to perpetuate this, is there? I'm sure by now he's washed his hair.' Sirius and James burst into fresh gales of laughter, and Lily gave Remus an exasperated thanks-for-nothing stare. He held his hands up in surrender and cheerfully changed the subject. "'Harry, how are you looking forward to America?' "'Can't wait.' The newly shorn girl glanced at Archie before continuing. "'It'll be interesting to travel abroad. I'm, uh, actually thinking of trying the healer track.' "'Really?' Remus chewed thoughtfully as her parents exchanged confused looks. "'That's a difficult area of specialization. I thought you were planning on pursuing a potions career.' "'Well, all the really advanced healing is done with potions nowadays,' Harry said, toying casually with her vegetables. "'If I want to make potions to help people, not just brew them for money, then I should see the problem from the other side, too.' Archie didn't think she was lying. She almost never did directly. She had mentioned wanting one day to be able to help people with the potions she invented, and many wizards did rely heavily on potions for the more complicated cures, but he knew if it weren't for him she wouldn't even consider a specialty in healing. That was all Archie. After watching his mother suffer for months under the influence of an illness there was no viable treatment for, he became obsessed with the idea of one day saving lives. When he first decided he wanted to be a healer, he'd asked his father if he could accompany Harry to a school in America, instead of taking the place reserved for him at Hogwarts. Sirius wouldn't hear of it. Archie thought his father's unusual unreasonableness on the subject was a combination of his fear that he'd be losing his son in a way too, if he went so far away, and his desire for Archie to have the same wonderful experiences he'd had in school. Hogwarts was where Sirius had met his best friends, where he'd met and fallen in love with Diana, Archie's mother. Their arguments on the subject of Archie's schooling had become so sour that when Harry had first idly suggested switching places to solve both their frustrations, Archie considered it seriously. He didn't want to disappoint his dad, but Sirius lived his life in the past, and Archie couldn't change that. He knew he could never bring his mum back. He might be able to one day be the difference that saved someone else's loved one, however, and to see that dream become a reality, he'd lie to the whole world if he had to. After dinner, the two cousins went up to Harry's room for a private goodbye. They wouldn't see one another until winter break at the earliest, and they had never been apart that long before. The long separation wasn't at the forefront of their minds, however. "'Did you get your dad to shrink yours, too?' Harry asked, producing a miniaturised trunk from a bookshelf. Archie produced his miniaturised trunk from his pocket and exchanged it for Harry's thankfully not-too-feminine one. They wouldn't be unshrunk until they reached their respective schools the following evening. Did you nick the potions from Uncle James' aura kit? This was the part of their plan he was least sure about. Unlike the rest of it, which seemed fairly innocent, stealing was so obviously wrong... He supposed he'd better get used to living in a state of moral greyness. Here. Harry pulled two beakers from under her bed, pouring doses of the mud-brown liquid into vials, one for each of them. You'll have to keep the beaker hidden. I've replaced it with a neutral concoction that smells and tastes as bad, but doesn't do anything. Hopefully he'll assume it's a defective batch. 
Archie nodded his understanding, and they both plucked hairs without further ado. Switching vials, they each drank the dose with the other's essence. Blurg! Archie shuddered, suddenly doubting he'd ever be able to drink the foul muck again, much less the dozens of times that would be required to make it seven years as his cousin. Then he wasn't thinking about the taste, because the transformation had seized a vicious hold of his innards. Whatever he'd anticipated, it was many times worse. His limbs quaked with the effort of not moaning aloud, and it was a long moment before he could open his eyes without them watering. When he did, he felt as though he were looking into a mirror. Weird, Archie squinted. You have awful eyesight, Harry. Give me your glasses. That explains why the world's so blurry. Harry took off her spectacles and blinked at the world around her, apparently enjoying her now perfect vision. Archie put the glasses on with a sigh of distaste. It would only be for a little while. They had enough stolen polyjuice to last until they were safely away from their parents the next morning, and after that Harry had contacts to correct her vision and change her eye colour to an unremarkable grey, while he had green contacts for thoroughness sake. He wasn't expecting to run into anyone at AIM who had even heard of the Potters. Harry was the one who would have a hard time pulling off their deception. I packed extra potions books into my trunk for you, so study up in case Mum mentions something in a letter I should know about, Harry said. Don't forget to learn a handwriting charm first thing so you can answer my parents' correspondence, and I'll do the same for the letters your dad sends. Keep an extra copy of what you write, and we'll exchange them by owl post at the end of the school year so we can keep our stories straight over the summer. All right, I remember, Archie said. Honestly... Harry acted as though it fell to her to take his mum's place sometimes. Not that he minded. March! He could see through her in any case. Harry was more nervous than she looked if she was rambling out instructions they'd already agreed upon. That's it, then. This is... goodbye. Harry looked a little lost for a moment, but quickly pulled it together to give him a firm... Good luck! Yeah. Archie felt a bit lost himself at the magnitude of what they were about to undertake. Arch? Yeah, Harry took a deep breath. Even if this blows up in our face and they kick me out before the first class, I'm saying right now, I don't regret anything. Archie was taken aback at her forthrightness, but squared his eleven-year-old shoulders nonetheless. Me neither, thank you. This was your idea, and without it, I would have taken years longer to reach my goal. It's also going to be a lot more dangerous for you. And, well, I'm grateful for everything, no matter what happens. Same. "'Thanks for letting me borrow your name, Arch,' Harry said, "'lightening the air between them with a lame attempt at levity. "'I'll try not to blacken it too much in the next seven years. "'Do your worst,' Archie said, grinning. "'Harry ducked into the boys' bathroom on the Hogwarts Express "'and waited in a stall for the polyjuice to wear off. "'Every moment seemed like an eternity, "'but she knew that was just her nerves getting the best of her. It was easier going than it had been coming. When she was herself again, she changed into Archie's school robes and moved to the sink to blink her new lenses into place. Staring back at her from the mirror was a sober-looking eleven-year-old boy with a halo of onyx curls and flat grey eyes. Her eyelashes were perhaps a bit too long to be masculine, but the lips were thin enough and the fragile bone structure could have belonged to any number of pure-blood lines. She'd heard the Malfoys in particular were known for their pointed faces. Her voice was too high-pitched at first, but with a little practice it dropped slightly to a more natural octave for a young boy. Satisfied, she exited the restroom and began to walk the length of the train, looking for a spare compartment. As she glanced around at all the excited faces, it began to dawn on her that she'd really done it. She'd got as far as the train without discovery, and everyone she met from now on would be complete strangers, so anything she messed up on would simply be attributed to Arcturus Black's unknown character. She pondered that for a moment. Arcturus Black. Arcturus Rigel Black. She wrinkled her nose. It felt too strange to be taking Archie's name, a name he didn't even like, no less. Should she refer to herself in her head as Archie, just to lessen the chance that she'd get confused and mess up? But then... How would she refer to Archie? After thinking on it for a long moment, she decided that as long as she was appropriating Archie's person, she might as well be decisive about it. While she was playing Archie's part, she would go by his middle name. From now on, I'll be Rigel Black, the best potion student Hogwarts has ever seen. Rigel. And wasn't it odd to rename herself in her own thoughts for convenience's sake? 
was nearly to the end of the train before she saw a promising compartment. There was only one boy sitting quietly within, reading the first-year herbology textbook. She slid open the door and nodded in greeting when the boy looked up. He had an open, cheerful face, with lank brown hair that fell across his forehead and brown eyes that held not a hint of malice. There was something familiar about him, and she wondered if her parents knew his. "'Are you saving these seats for anyone?' she asked. "Er, uh, no.' The kid looked surprised that she would think that. "'You can sit if you want.' "'Thank you.' She shut the door and took a seat across from him. "'I'm Rigel,' she said, trying out the name for the first time aloud. "'Neville.' He smiled tentatively. It looked as though he would say something else, but he refrained. He was probably used to giving his last name when introducing himself. Most purebloods gave their family name as a courtesy. She'd rather not bring up her borrowed last name just yet, however. The black name could swing either way, depending on whether his parents had told him they were dark purebloods or blood traitors. Pleased to meet you. Is that one thousand magical herbs and fungi? Rigel nodded at the book in Neville's lap. He glanced down at it as if to check, but caught himself and flushed. Yeah, um, have you read much of it yet? I have she said, then backtracked, as the boy looked significantly alarmed. I don't think you need to have read any of it, though. I was only interested because herbology has a lot to do with potions. Oh, Neville looked much relieved. So, you like potions, then? I read the introduction to that textbook, too, but it looks complicated, and the first potion listed uses toad parts. I have a toad. His name is Trevor. I don't know if I like the idea of dissecting animals for parts. You won't have to do the harvesting, most likely. The professor will have the ingredients already, Rigel said. You think? Uh, maybe it won't be so bad, then. Neville swung his feet a bit nervously, then blurted, What house do you think you'll be sorted into? I'm hoping for Slytherin, she said honestly. You Slytherin? Neville squeaked. From that reaction, I'm guessing your family are Gryffindors, so are mine, Rigel admitted. And you're actually hoping for Slytherin? He looked half doubtful, half confused. "'The potions master at Hogwarts is the head of Slytherin House,' she explained. "'I've heard he favours his own house, so the best chance I have at getting extra tutoring from him is to be in Slytherin.' "'You go against your line for some extra help in potions?' Neville bit his lip. "'Can you even do that? Pick your house against tradition, I mean? Maybe not, but I think I can meet the requirements if I get the chance. I just have to be cunning and ambitious, right?' "'Well, good luck,' he offered kindly. "'Thank you,' she said. "'I hope you like the house you get as well.' They spent the rest of the trip in comfortable silence. The only interruption was when Neville quietly asked if Rigel would leave so he could change into his school robes. Rigel didn't mind stepping outside to wait if it made the shy boy more comfortable, though she was quite desensitised to the male form thanks to Archie's complete lack of modesty. While she was standing outside the compartment, a tall boy with deep-set features and a surly expression approached from the other end of the train. Due to the narrowness of the corridor, she was partially blocking his way. Instead of just walking around her, however, he veered and slammed a heavily muscled shoulder into her side. Not expecting it, she fell sideways to the ugly carpet and awkwardly broke her fall with her elbows. Pushing herself back up to her knees, she glared at the boy who was sneering down at her. "'Are you blind?' she asked, remembering to pitch her voice deeper, the way Archie's went when he got angry just in time. The moment his eyes narrowed, she knew she shouldn't have said that. The boy was much larger and meaner looking than any kid she'd ever met, and despite her reluctance to take open hostility lying down, she had to admit she hadn't thought it through— the bigger boy advanced on her almost casually, shoving a foot toward her middle. Only a swift roll in the opposite direction saved her from a bruised belly. She got to her feet and rounded on the kid, taking in their respective heights at close range and deciding he was maybe a fifth or sixth year. "'My apologies,' she said through gritted teeth. "'Better to defuse the situation than get in over her head. "'Obviously you're not blind, just rather upset, but there's no need to take it out on me.' He took a step toward her with clenched fists, then paused and pulled out his wand instead, a nasty smirk on his face. Little first years should know better than to talk faster than their wands can move. Consider this your first lesson. When an upper-class man kicks you, stay down. I might if I thought it would make you go away, Rigel thought, stiffening her spine and preparing to take whatever curse he tossed her way.
Before either of them could make a move, a stern voice from down the train called, "'You there! No fighting on the train!' A thin, red-headed boy with a gleaming gold badge on his chest strutted importantly to stand between Rigel and the surly boy, neither of whom had relaxed. Flint, the redhead said upon catching sight of the other boy's face, I might have known. I'll be taking ten points from Slytherin when we get to Hogwarts for pulling your wand on another student, and a first year, no less. Flint curled his lip at the boy. Weasley. Apparently that was enough said, for he turned and stalked off with only a last annoyed glare in Rigel's direction. Nothing but trouble this time of year, that one. The freckled boy sighed. He looked down at Rigel with a slight frown. All right there. Bad luck getting in Flint's way your first day. He likes to hold a grudge, so be sure to steer clear for a few weeks. I certainly won't go seeking him out, she said, straightening her robes. Thank you for the intervention. It was no trouble. "'the boy said airily. "'I was only doing my duty as a prefect.' "'Rigel nodded once more in thanks, "'then turned to rejoin Neville in their compartment. "'If he wondered why she'd stayed outside for so long, "'he didn't ask. "'She reclaimed her seat silently, lost in thought. "'Not even to Hogwarts yet, "'and she'd already made an enemy. "'She hoped fervently this wasn't a sign "'of more such instances to come. "'She also hoped Archie was faring better "'with his side of the ruse, wherever he was.' 